After the hour, so let's get started. Well, good morning. My name is Mark Dowling. I'm the Chief Executive Officer here with the Inland Valleys Association of Realtors. And good morning. I uh, appreciate everybody participating in today's webinar and conversation with our guest speaker, Mr. Steve Pontell. Before I get into introducing Steve, let me just take a minute and kind of frame uh, the, the discussion for today's uh, webinar. In real estate, as a realtor and a realtor association, our bread and butter is single family housing and home ownership. We love it, we stress it, we encourage it, and we do everything we can to support it. That's our industry. However, we also understand that when you work in real estate, not everybody is going to be a homeowner. In fact, there's going to be lots of people within communities that have different types of housing, rental housing, veterans housing, disabled housing, Section 8 housing, whatever it may be. And the fact is, when you have a community, we have to figure out ways in which we can house everybody in the community. It's not just about housing for certain segments of the population. It's about having a, a, a holistic approach and understanding how to build strength and, and stability and a quality place and a quality environment for everybody to live in. So with that, our speaker today is Mr. Steve Pontel. Steve is the president and CEO with the National Community Renaissance, or National Corps, and they are the fifth or sixth largest, and maybe Steve can identify which one you guys are at this point, fifth or sixth largest affordable housing developer in the country. They're headquartered in Rancho Cucamonga. I've had the opportunity to work with Steve and know Steve for over 35 years. He is a, a local person. He grew up in Big Bear, graduate of Big Bear High School. Um, has been down working in the Inland Empire now for decades and has uh, done a fantastic job representing positions of leadership at all levels. He's been with National Corps about nine years now, Steve? Nine years. Yeah. Is the longest you've been with one company? The longest I've been anywhere, yeah. Well, congratulations on yeah, that. Thank you. Um, so with that, Steve, let me kind of just, uh, done the introduction, let me kind of just ask you, Tell me a little bit about National Core, kind of who you are, kind of what your company does. Sure, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity and hello to everybody who showed up today to listen. So National Core is a 501c3 nonprofit. We are developers, so we put together projects throughout Southern California, Texas, and Florida, about 80% in Southern California. We're also general contractors, so we build our own projects. We currently have four under construction. We just opened two and we're getting ready to start two more. Uh, we're under construction in um, Inglewood, Ontario, Rancho Cucamonga, San Bernardino. We just opened two new projects in San Diego. Um, we're also property managers. We manage about 8,500 of our 9,000 units. Um, and then we also have our Hope Through Housing Foundation, which delivers services to our residents. And we do after school programs for kids. We do family self-sufficiency uh, programs, including path words towards economic stability, uh, which includes the path towards home ownership. And then we also have about 2,500 senior properties, uh, 2,500 senior units where our primary focus is on senior wellness. And we work very hard, especially since COVID, and I can show some stories about that, what we've done to keep our seniors um, healthy during the isolation of the virus. And so that's a thumbnail. Um, as you said, we're headquartered in Rancho Cucamonga, and we work very hard to provide housing that people can afford. So with a variety of different affordable housing groups and developers out there, how would you say National Corps is different or similar? I mean, do you guys look at yourselves differently and the projects you build, the culture you create? Tell me, if, sure. if, tell me about that. Sure, great question. So the, it, we're similar in a lot of ways to other nonprofit affordable housing developers. Um, and we compete with them throughout the region. And there's some very sophisticated developers that, that, um, uh, that we either compete with or we often partner with as well. Uh, a couple areas that I believe that were different, you know, number one is our focus is actually to help our families move out of our units. And so we spend a lot of time counseling and encouraging and, and creating those pathways that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the reason for that is we have thousands of families on our wait list. Uh, just to give one example, we opened a new property in Glendale last year, 68 units. Uh, we had 6,800 applicants in two weeks. 
And so wow. just to give an idea of the demand for what we build, um, because affordability is such a challenge. And it, the easiest thing to do is to keep residents as long as possible. None of the agencies that fund our projects encourage us to help our families move out. Um, we do it because we believe it's the right thing to do. And a lot of organizations don't do it because turns cost money. So you want to, normally you want to keep residents as long as possible, but that's one difference. Um, another difference is we tend to be more community developers than just housing developers. So we're the only affordable houser that has a planning department. So we can do specific plans, housing elements for cities, you know, very sophisticated planning projects as an organization. And so being, I believe, the most fully integrated affordable houser gives us some competitive advantages. So we, as I said, we develop, we build, and we keep them for the long haul. And so we manage them very well. One of the things that we're most proud about is I would challenge people to, to distinguish the difference between any of our projects and any market rate project um, because they can't. And so at the end of the day, the quality of what we build is very high. And we want to produce a high quality of life for our residents. And that's very important to us. So when you, when people hear in the community an affordable housing project, they typically recoil in fear. There are concerns just hearing those terms. So the fact is, and you just said it a second ago, your projects are high quality. Kind of how do you present your projects to the community and who are your customers? How, how does that work? Sure, great question. So there's a history of public housing. And so, and the history of public housing and the image and perception of public housing is not great. And a lot of the worst public housing has been torn down. And so even public housing is not what it's perceived to be historically. Um, but public housing always targeted the very lowest income. The primary product we build are tax credit projects, which are for working families. And so these are people that, you know, probably the average income living in our properties would be people at 40% of the median income. Right. And the, the rents can go from 20% to 40% to 60%. Um, and so these are working families. These are the people we need in our communities, uh, especially the further west you go, the harder it is for, for people that are working in stores and restaurants and hotels and even teachers and, and public, you know, public employees to be able to have housing that they can afford um, is a real challenge. And so that's, a pop, that's the bulk of the population that we serve. There are housing projects that we're doing now that are for the chronically homeless. And so the second issue that people have is that, you know, we don't want those people in our neighborhood. Our argument is those people are already in your neighborhood. Wouldn't it be better that they were housed than living on the streets? And so how can we begin as a society and a culture to really honestly address the deficiency we have in housing, which is primarily a supply problem, but also for those people that do have needs, whether it's mental health issues or physical disabilities, um, I think we as a society have an obligation to make sure that we're providing opportunities for them other than living on the streets. And so those are some of the discussions we get into communities. Um, we've only had one project that never made it through the entitlement process, and it was in the city of industry, and we can go into that, which was a whole different set of issues. Um, but for the most part, we usually win the neighborhoods over, and then once our projects are built, our developments are built, um, then the neighborhoods become big supporters because we're a very positive, transformative force uh, in the neighborhoods where we develop. So you mentioned earlier that you're building projects or planning projects in Ontario, Rancho Cucamonga, and San Bernardino. Right. And our membership is working and exists in a lot of those communities. Can you maybe talk a little bit about each one of those projects and kind of what sure. they and how they may be different than one another? Sure. So the largest project we have going is the third phase of the redevelopment of the old Waterman Gardens public housing in San Bernardino. It's been renamed Arrowhead Grove. The first two phases are, have been up and operating for about five, the first one for about five years now, Valencia Vista. Um, and the second one, Olive Meadow, is about three years. The third phase, um, Crestview Terrace, is 184 units under construction. Within that 184 units, there are actually 36 market rate units that are going to be part of the mix because we're very interested in that, making sure we have a mixed income neighborhood. Right. not a high concentration of the very lowest incomes. And it's gonna be, this is the first market rate apartments built in San Bernardino that are not senior or student housing in forever, the last 30 years at least. Yeah. And so we're trying to create a market for, for a market rate units. And we think the opportunities there because 
you know, the people that live in San Bernardino don't work there and the people that work in San Bernardino don't live there. There's a real need for quality housing for the people that work there um, in many industries uh, throughout the city. And How so many total that, units in that, in that development? Will you build by that? the time by the time we're done there will be about 520 total units um, mm -hmm. and it'll be a mix of both incomes um, types of populations seniors there will be a senior phase and there will also be a commercial phase and, and what uh, were you replacing what was there before so you built yeah, what was there before yeah there were 252 ish units of public housing there was 1943 military housing that converted to public housing and it was a property that had a long history of challenges. Um, the housing authority in more recent years had managed it very well. Uh, and so the, the federal government launched a program called RAD, the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program that allowed for the conversion of public housing to more traditional affordable housing. And so we began taking on the neighborhood transformation um, about six years ago, seven years okay. ago now. And one of the first things we did actually for that neighborhood was a specific plan for the entire neighborhood to uh, try and attract investment into that neighborhood and encourage property owners to invest in their properties. And so we're continuing to work on that with businesses in the neighborhood um, and continuing to try and, and you know, see what kind of positive effect we can also have on the residential units within the neighborhood as well. Um, one of the things that we find is for first time home buyers, San Bernardino is still a great opportunity. And that's one of the things that the Inland Empire has that most of Southern California doesn't have are opportunities for first, first time home buyers. So we've actually helped a number of our residents in other properties in Rialto and Fontana and Rancho, et cetera, buy homes in San Bernardino. And um, it's something that we pay, you know, we're thinking through the entire system and the, you know, the continuum of housing choices. Uh, right. And uh, we'd welcome to give, you know, give a tour, show people what's going on there. And if you know what the neighborhood was like and you see what we've done in the neighborhood, one story I'll share with the hope that, you know, so far the story is still holding true is when we were under construction with the first phase, the construction fencing was tagged every night. And so when we took down the construction fencing, I was thinking, okay, great, this is going to be a constant challenge. And we had one wall that's about 40 feet long, six feet tall, pure white wall along the eastern edge of the property. I was thinking, what a great canvas. Since we've been open, we have not been tagged once in that neighborhood. And I believe it just shows how the neighborhood appreciates investment and quality in the neighborhood and people respect that. And so that's been very positive. Um, the ne the ne project that's gonna open is, as a matter of fact, we just opened the wait list this Monday is uh, Day Creek Villas in Rancho Cucamonga, uh, right at the Northwest corner of Baseline and Day Creek behind mm -hmm. the new Stater Brothers Shopping Center. We have about 140 units of senior properties we fully expect that this wait list will be similar to Glendale. Um, I can't tell you how many people have called me saying, hey, my mom, my, you know, whoever. And it's like, sorry, the wait list is the way to go. You go to our website, get on the wait list. This is going to also be a lottery. And so when you think about 140 units, if we have two, three, four, five thousand people apply, the people who win this lottery will truly have won a lottery. I mean, this is a huge right. opportunity. And this is a beautiful project. I mean, this thing is absolutely gorgeous. City of Rancho Cucamonga wanted to maintain extraordinarily high standards. The units are large. They the usually do. Balcony. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, and so we're very excited about that. And then the Ontario project's a family project on Holt, just west of Grove. And this was a, both uh, uh, the San Bernardino project and the Ontario project. We won Strategic Growth Council cap and trade funding. And so part of the cap and trade process is building quality housing that is net zero energy. So all three of these are net zero housing projects um, is something that the cap and trade program is supporting. And so we were fortunate to partner with the city of Ontario and win cap and trade funding for the project in Ontario. Um, it's also about 140 units of family and uh, it'll probably be open in about eight to 10 months. And so that project is moving forward very well. And another transformative impact on Holt in Ontario. And we're looking at surrounding properties to see, you know, what other opportunities might present themselves there as well. Right. So one of the issues, obviously, in California, and we hear it all the time, and I experienced it when I was a broker and a builder as well, and you were involved as well, is it's difficult to build in California. It is task. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes expertise. 
briefly, if you can, kind of walk through how you guys get a project through in just the general timeline from when you guys initiate a project to when you think it will be done. Now, I know there's a lot involved, and I don't want you to go through every step of the project, but from a general timeline, can right. you kind of walk us through what that means? And I know that you guys have complicated projects because the financing is unique and how you guys put that together. Yeah. So it is highly variable city by city. And so that's the first step. And so I'll just give you two examples. San Bernardino, first phase at Arrowhead Grove, Valencia Vista. From the time we got site control on five acres till the time we were fully entitled, including environmental, was 90 days. And so if the city wants to do something, they can get it done. A 19 unit project we did in Pasadena for chronically homeless families in partnership with First Five, so these are with little children, mm -hmm. seven years to get through the process. Wow. And so at the end of the day, the variability city by city is something that you cannot underestimate. And you wanna, you wanna be sure you then, you know, kind of map that out. You know, today there are multiple challenges um, you know, and I'll just try and summarize a couple of the biggest ones. You know, one of the big challenges is that the various agencies do not coordinate well with each other and they do not think holistically or systemically about how to address certain issues. Um, one example I use is, you know, the, the stormwater uh, mitigation measures for an MS4 permit is 100% retention of stormwater on a site based on a certain flood size, et cetera whether or not the site percolates, you know, whether or not it makes any sense, whether or not the stormwater mitigation is going to be maintained for the life of the project, whether or not it's gonna sediment up and not be any you know, use anyway. Um, you would think a city would talk to a water agency about, hey, where do you want the stormwater to go so that it can recharge the groundwater right. and come up with a, with a community plan to address that. So instead of putting the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar $500,000 cost on our project to mitigate that issue, and us dealing with each agency separately, you know, there is a huge opportunity for coordination among various agencies if they want something to be done. And so that's one of the challenges I throw out to cities all the time. And then of course the big, you know, elephant in the room is CEQA and the California Environmental Quality Act is a tool for people that wanna stop things. And unfortunately, the uh, purview of CEQA continues to be expanded as far as the number of things that would trigger a CEQA review. And so you have to be very diligent and very smart about how you go through the process. Fortunately, this is one of the advantages affordable housers have. There are certain things that we do that are by right, that we, we go through CEQA, but at the end of the day, we cannot then further be further challenged and drug out through endless litigation, which is the way many, many market rate projects are delayed, is just the, once one lawsuit's resolved, another one will be filed, another one will be filed. So delay right. and conquer is one of the real tools. But that is something that you have to be very thoughtful about from the very beginning. What are the impacts of the project? How do we mitigate them? And then how, you know, how do we manage the cost of, of a lot of the requirements that are put on our projects? So one of the things that I talk about is our actual cost to build a unit. People talk about the cost of affordable housing being so high, which it is. The actual cost to build a unit averages about 150000 a unit. And then on top of that, it's $100,000 in fees and, and costs and 100, another 100,000 in mitigation and process and time, plus the cost of land. So we're $350,000 plus the cost of land per unit, you know, building an affordable housing project. And so at, you know, at some point we shifted where the purpose of a house was not just to provide shelter, but the purpose of a house is to build a road, put in a signal, deal with, you know, storm drains, <coughs> deal with, fill in the blank schools, et cetera. And I think we have a, a conversation to be had about, are we paying for things the best way to get them done? Is it fair and equitable? And because it's such an impediment to providing housing, which is what we need so much of, I think we need to seriously think about that. But, but to answer your question, we go, our development process is the same as any market rate developer. We do have a few advantages here and there um, where we can get some setback, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, some additional setback opportunities and some reduced parking requirements because we're building affordable housing. Um, but the other thing we have is, you pointed out earlier, is the community coming out against it. And so we have to spend probably more time winning the community over because there's a lot of opposition. You know, we don't want those people in our neighborhood. 
So on that issue of dealing with the community and the whole NIMBY issue, which is now evolved into banana, which is build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. And that is the general attitude with lots of communities. They don't want to see any development. Quite frankly, they don't want to see any change. What are some of the things you've done or can you tell us a, a story where you initially had a position from a community and in time or through a strategy, you were able to flip the community and gain their support. Do you have any stories along those lines? Well, the San Bernardino one is a great example. The opposite, I mean, the, if the community had had their way, the old public housing would have been torn, put, torn down and it would have just been left a park. I mean, that would have been, you know, the, the desired outcome. Um, and the community opposition was, a lot of it was based on, look, we, don't, we certainly don't want more units and we don't really understand how this is gonna work and et cetera. And so we spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one meeting with people, meeting with small groups, you know, having dinner, touring our other properties to show people this is what we're building. Uh, facts matter. And when, so if you can address misperceptions and misconceptions that people have, that goes a long way. And then building trust and relationship. And so the final planning commission hearing, um, this one gentleman got up who had been opposed and by the end he goes, okay, I, I will... I will never support an affordable housing project, but I'm not going to oppose this one. And so for me, that was a huge one. It was, I'll take that. Sure. And so we made it through with unanimous support at the planning commission, unanimous support at the city council, and starting with almost total opposition. And so it's a, it, it takes time, building relationship, building trust um, as we go forward. And in most communities, we're able to accomplish that. And so it is a, um, you know, it's not, complicated but it's hard work in order to make projects move forward absolutely now i know when you finance your projects every project is unique relative to how it comes together and it's funded um it's not a traditional or market type of a development can you maybe take a minute or two and kind of explain how you put sure. together financing to actually build your projects sure so i'll give a traditional tax credit so tax credits low-income housing tax credits lie tech are provided by the federal government and they are bought. Um, there's 9% tax credits and 4% tax credits. And it just, the, it's the value of the tax credit over time. And so um, on a typical 9% tax credit deal, you know, let's say it's a $25 million deal. Uh, the value of the tax credits can be about $10 million of equity. And so that becomes the equity in the project. Usually tax credits are bought by banks because they also get CRA credit for buying mm -hmm. low income housing tax credits. And CRA is Community Reinvestment Act. Correct. So it's the federal okay. requirement that banks have to invest so much money into neighborhoods and communities where they're right. growing and doing business. And so, and, and LIHTC is a safe, and they've, it, historically it's been a very safe investment for banks. So they, you know, they're comfortable with doing that. And then on top of that $10 million, we then get conventional debt. And so the conventional debt usually would be about the same amount, so another $10 million of conventional debt on the project. And so the first $20 million of the project is, if you can win the tax credit, it's very competitive to win a tax credit in California. Once you've won the tax credits, the, 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 you know, the 20 million out of the 25 is pretty well set. The rest of the 5 million comes in much smaller tranches. So. The, the city, if the, in the old days of redevelopment, the cities used redevelopment money. Right. Today, cities can use CDBG or home funds or some cities have inclusionary fees. And so some cities are generating a certain amount of money they can put towards the deal. You can talk to the housing authority about adding some vouchers into the deal. And so you know, we try and avoid prevailing wage as often as possible. And so we never really want more than eight housing authority vouchers in a project because then that's under the prevailing wage threshold. And then you can go for additional special needs money. So one of the populations that we care about a lot are foster kids. You know, 80% of foster kids end up homeless. And so there is money to support foster kids having housing. And so we'll usually try and layer in some of that kind of funding for that targeted population right. as well. And then there are other targeted populations for which there can also be. So there could be some veteran funding, um, there can be some other developmental disability funding. Um, so there are a variety of different types of funding that can be put together. And, and then you stack all that. Usually it's 10 different sources to 12 different sources by the time wow. we're done. 
as I said, the Strategic Growth Council was a big part of the funding in the, this most recent phase in San Bernardino. And, um, and then the challenge is, you know, the ongoing compliance. So we are audited by every one of those funding sources every year. And, and they all have different requirements. And so it's, uh, it's quite the matrix of trying to check every box and make sure everybody is satisfied. Um, right. Which is why most market rate developers stay out of the affordable housing because it's a very complicated and time intensive management and compliance um, part of the equation. And so, but at the end of the day, we've got to figure it out. One of the things that we're doing now is we're really spending a lot of time trying to think about what's known as NOAA, naturally occurring affordable housing. And so we just cut a, I'll just go ahead and tell you, we just cut a recent yeah. deal in uh, the San Fernando Valley in partnership with Watt Development and together with the backing of a large private investment fund, uh, we bought 620 market rate units that were class C properties. And so they were lower rent because of the quality of the units, not the desirable, you know, not the physical environment was not necessarily sure. desirable. You know, kind of the analogy is where the environmental quality inside is worse than the environmental quality outside. <laughs> and so we were able to acquire those units um, facilitate rehab of those units and then maintain them at 80% of the median income. And so we did that, you know, using almost all private funding with the one exception because we're involved and because we're agreeing to a covenant to keep the rents at 80%, we can get the, what's called the welfare tax exemption, the property tax exemption. So not having to pay the property taxes gives the investor the return they need in order to bring you know a sizable chunk of money to the deal and so if you look at the need so just to put it in context if 40,000 homeless on the streets of los angeles county you know building 40,000 units at an average cost of 500,000 a unit which is probably low in la county is about 20 billion dollars so when the city says oh we have a billion dollars towards you know the homeless problem that's not a scratch. I mean, it, it, where the numbers right. don't even begin to add up. So we're focusing a lot of energy. How do we get private dollars, private investment to help solve housing from an affordability standpoint and do that with as little government subsidy as possible? And that's one of our top priorities for the next couple of years is continuing to try and figure that out. Very good. Let me just make a quick comment. If anybody's listening through this webinar right now and you have a question for Steve, you can do so. Just go to the chat button on the bottom of your screen, write a question, and I will relay it to Steve, okay? So let me ask another question, Steve. Um, can you think, I mean, you talked a little bit about transitioning people from your properties into home ownership and also your foundation. Can you think of any success stories in, in your years at, uh, at, at National Corps where you kind of seen families grow or individuals grow from, you know, the dependency on government subsidies toward home ownership? Yeah, we, um, we featured, so in two ways, um, you know, what, and we seem to have the most success with children that grow up on our properties. So it's breaking the cycle of poverty is how it's characterized. So we focus mm -hmm. a lot on after school programs, education, and really helping kids that are living on our properties you know, they want to go to college. And so we, we celebrated the success of a young man that grew up in one of our properties, bought his first home in Fontana, and shared the story about being a homeowner and what that meant to him. And so that is something that we have a lot of, uh, we have not infrequent examples of that. We do have families that when we can sit down with them, so, you know, there have been studies done that one of the biggest challenges about poverty is your time horizon. When you have to survive today, you can't look past to today. And when you don't know how you're gonna survive this week, you can't look into next week. And so one of the goals that we do is sit with people and help expand their time horizon to show here's a path. If you start doing these things, you can begin to start saving and that can lead you to future opportunities. And right. people are very responsive to that because it, it's, not, it's not easy to think in that way. But one of the biggest challenges that's happening is the gap between an affordable unit and a market rate unit. So just a real quick example, you know, in Rancho Cucamonga, one of our units for a family of four, two bedrooms at 60% of median income might be 11 or $1,200 a month. That same market rate unit could easily be 22, $2,500 a month. And so for somebody at 60% of median, if they get a raise to 80% of median, or even if they get to median, 
they can't make that rent jump. And so, you know, one of the, it's called the missing middle. We have this growing gap between subsidized and market rate which the primary way people respond to the prices they can't afford is through overcrowding. And so the reason we have two, three, four, five, six families living in single houses and apartments is just they have to aggregate their income in order to make it work. And so those are some of the things is how do we create those stepping stones to lead from right. subsidy into market rate alternatives? One of the most important we think being home ownership. Very good. Okay, I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, one is asking, how do you get information if someone's curious about the project in Rancho Cucamonga? What's the best way for someone to get information on that? Uh, the best way would be to go to our website. Okay. Just confirm that. Chris, on our website is the waitlist information for Day Creek Villas. Yeah. So go to nationalcore.org. Uh, Org. <laughs> I think is our website. Yes. Um, and you can look for Day Creek Villas. And there will be information about how to get on that wait list. And um, I mean, I can tell you, it would be a property I, I would, I should maybe think about getting on the wait list. <laughs> well, you're certainly old it's, enough now. If, uh, no, it's 62 and above, so I'm not quite oh, there. Oh, you're but, not there. Um, but, um, uh, but if I got on the wait list now, maybe I'd have a chance by the time I was 70 or something. There you go. Yeah. Now, when you have a wait list like that, is it always a lottery system? No, the, the initial is a lottery. So the f opening of the property is a lottery. Okay. And then after that, it's first come, first serve. And so okay. we kind of keep track of how people are turning in and then the lottery goes and then they pick off of the list as it goes forward. Very good. I've and usually just our average mm -hmm. senior wait list is somewhere around five to seven years. So you get on a wait list, you just anticipate you're going to be waiting about five years to get into a property. That, that's a long wait for seniors. Okay. The, I know, I know. You need to speed that up and help them out. Yeah, we need more units. I have another question here from Pam Lingren. She's asking, who should, who's the contact person with the National Corps if one of our members is aware of land that might be a good project resource for you, if there's a, an opportunity? Sure, and we get those calls all the time. So, but first let me tell you the, the primary criteria, if you have a piece of land, is number one, does the city want an affordable project there? Right. So, that, so if you could do that initial inquiry, that would be very helpful. And then the second thing is, are there any local funding sources that are going to be able to fill that gap, to be able to fill the gap? And so, you know, we get opportunities for property in cities all the time where the cities have no money, the counties, you know, there is no resources to actually make it happen. And so, you know, a little bit of homework about that would be helpful. Um, but the lead person in our organization would be Ashley Wright. You know, once again, if you go to our website, you can find Ashley. He's our senior vice president of development. And okay. um, feel free to, you know, he gets emails all the time from realtors uh, with great deals. And so. Um, Very good. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it's a complicated formula. And, you know, we have, you know, you know, George Wong. George does all of our analysis. And so he can crank a piece of property through the grid to see what does that property qualify for. And, you know, it has to do with location with regard to schools and, and retail right. and transit and all of those are scoring factors in being able to win funding. Great. Uh, I have another question. So if you're going to fix the system, mm -hmm. and by that I mean, let's just take local government, for example, because clearly there's local, there's state, and there's national policies involved in development. However, at the local level, it's probably most prominent, local control, as the largest role relative to development. So if you could pick two or three things that you would like to see happen at the local level, statewide, but local level, what would you suggest you'd like to see happen? Sure, good question. So the other acronym that we're dealing with is NIMTOF. You know what <laughs> NIMTOF is? No. N not in my term of office. And so <laughs> one, the, the, the political backbone to do what's right, just to be very candid, is probably one of the most important things. And politicians can get backbone if they perceive their support. And so I, when I've spoken to Ivar in the past, it's you know, show up to play, you know, be for projects, show up. You know, you guys have a huge army that you can mobilize. And usually the people that show up are the no's. And I don't care right. what kind of project it is, just show up and be a yes, say, hey, we need to keep growing and moving and developing, you know, because people are important as we go forward. And that gives elected officials backbone. 
And so we try and build coalitions among the business community, education, the health community. Housing is one of the most critical social determinants of health. The faith community, I've gotten to know the Bishop of the Episcopal Church pretty well. And he said, hey, you ever have a meeting and you need a bunch of Episcopalians to show up, just let me know. I'm thinking that can't be a bad thing. And so- um, Are there many? I mean, are we talking like 15 yeah, Episcopalians? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, uh, uh, on some of those mainline denominations are, they're definitely <laughs> aging. But um, um, so building coalitions to give the elected officials the backbone. And then the, the main thing that I encourage cities is know your numbers. I mean, just be honest about what's the need. What, what, how, what is your deficiency in housing? How are people living in your communities? You know, and, and what is the consequence of that on your community? on businesses in your community, on families, on social services, et cetera. And then also know your costs because most cities don't count the costs that they put on, they don't count time as a cost. They don't count mitigations as a cost. You know, they don't count, you know, legal threat as a cost. And so at the end of the day, cities, you know, the only thing they really count as a cost is the fee you pay as a developer's fee. Well, that's just a fraction of the total cost. And so cities could be really helpful if they were thoughtful about, okay, wait a minute, you know, a project taking seven years to get to an entitlement process, that adds hundreds of thousands of dollars per unit to the project. And the, you know, every time there's a redesign, hey, we wanna see what this facade would look like, or how about from this angle, you know, all of that right. costs money. And so that's one of the things I encourage cities, just know your cost. And then you then make a conscious decision. Okay, we know we're requiring this and we know this is going to add this much per unit and we're okay with the renter or the homeowner paying that make a conscious decision because right now most cities are making unconscious decisions because they don't see the cost is you know directly affecting their their future residents of their community right. um and so those, those are the kinds of things and then once again it goes back to creating a coalition of the willing you know there are certain cities you know, I'll, you know, I'll say Rancho Cucamonga and Ontario are both cities that want development projects to occur. And so they have the political where, you know, willingness to, to step up and push projects forward. And um, so we're much less inclined to want to do a project where we know, you know, the council doesn't have the political will to fight through any neighborhood opposition. Right. It is interesting. You mentioned Rancho Cucamonga. Most of the people who are familiar with that city would say it's one of the nicer cities in the Inland Empire. Okay. It also happens to be the city that has the highest ratio of high density uh, multifamily and affordable housing units of any city in the Inland Empire. You can build quality multifamily, quality affordable projects and still maintain a great city. And Rancho Cucamonga is really a fantastic template and example of doing that. Well, and that was one of the things that I was amused by in San Bernardino. People would get up at the planning commission is we want to be like Rancho Cucamonga. We want to be like Rancho Cucamonga. And I'm like, then you want this project because we have like eight projects in Rancho Cucamonga. So right. if you want to be like Rancho, then this is the kind of project you want. Great. Do you have a question from member Maria Johnson? She's asking, do you have any plans for a project in Riverside or are you looking for land in Riverside? Yeah, we have two projects underway in Riverside. One is a home ownership project that'll mm -hmm. be, um, I, I don't, I, I can get you the details, but I think it's like 27 total units of which maybe a half a dozen of them will be affordable and the rest will be market rate home ownership. And so is that an attached be, product? No, detached single family homes. Okay. Um, but it's an, uh, it's a affordable home ownership opportunity um, that's currently going through final, you know, uh, review at the city. And then we have a project in partnership with um, um, uh, see, uh, uh, the, the Seventh-day Adventist College in Riverside yes. that my daughter went to for a year, Sierra, Sierra, yes, La Sierra. La Sierra. La Sierra. Yeah. Yeah. So we're partners, a piece of property adjacent to La Sierra that was owned by the Seventh-day Adventist National Organization. Mm -hmm. And that'll be a multifamily project that we're moving forward with. Um, we do have projects in Riverside, two of them. And we also have projects in Corona, um, quite a few projects out in the Coachella Valley. Uh, we're, we're one of two finalists for a project in Murrieta right now. Um, we're looking at, um, and we've been looking at a project in Temecula for a while. Um, so we're pretty active. Uh, many of your members may know Tony Mize. Tony's our you know, lead in Riverside County. And yes. so we're constantly looking for opportunities throughout Riverside County. And Fantastic. Very good. 
So you have National Core, which is a 501c3 uh, development end of it. You also mentioned the housing, Hope Through Housing Foundation. Okay. Correct. Maybe take a minute and kind of explain what that is and how it partners with National Core. Sure. So when we do the services on our properties, we are able to layer in a per door fee for services, mm -hmm. maybe $20 a door per month. And so if you have 100 units, $2,000 a month can go towards the service. Um, the total budget for Hope Through Housing is about $5 million a year. About one and a half million of that comes from those door fees. So the rest of it, we, we raise or national core supports. And so uh, Hope Through Housing raises around one and a half to two million a year. You know, we used to have an annual gala. This year, it's not looking like we're going to have a gala. Right. Um, but just to give an example of the team, so when the virus hit, most of our programming is in community centers, obviously after school programs, getting seniors together, et cetera. All of that got canceled immediately. And our entire team pivoted. And I think we're over 50,000 families that we've delivered food to. Um, we're calling our seniors every week. Uh, and providing you know, a lot of that food to our seniors. Uh, they are a very vulnerable population and with their you know, isolation, normally they have a tendency to isolate. Now they're right. being told to isolate. And so they're our biggest concern at this point. And I have to give the team huge kudos that they were able to pivot and completely shift all of our you know, programming and everything we're doing uh, uh, because of the virus. You know, we, we, we got 43 pallets of goods from Amazon. And so there were 30 boxes per pallet, completely random stuff. You'd open a box, they were in categories. So home goods, personal hygiene, food, yeah. toys, school supplies, whatever. But it could be some kind of, you know, never heard before, you know, green tea to Reese's peanut butter cups to paper plates and batteries and I mean, and so the team did a great job distributing that out to our properties, and then they did a great job distributing it to our residents. And so we've been able to partner with a lot of organizations that have made donations of food and mm -hmm. donations of other things that residents need. And, uh, and so that's what we hope through housing does, is we believe that the physical shelter is important, but that's not the end of it. The programming and the support of our residents is also very, very important. Um, and it goes to that whole transformation and quality of life of the people living in affordable housing, where the affordable housing is a platform. Uh, you know, we talk about it, we, we don't want it to be a landing pad, we want it to be a launching pad. Right. And so we spend a lot of energy trying to make sure we're working with our residents in that capacity. Fantastic. I mean, another question here from Mary Brown Edwards. She's asking about the Temecula and Marietta projects. Are they on National Corps' website as well? No, because they're, they're not. just and they're just still being negotiated, pursued. Yeah. Okay. Very and good. We have we probably have thirty projects in our development pipeline throughout Southern California right now. Okay. All in various states of possibility. Okay. Fantastic. Well, we are coming to a conclusion here timing wise. Um, Steve, I just want to thank you so much for participating in our webinar today. I want to thank you for uh, leading National Corps. You guys are a tremendous asset to our community. Thank you for the projects you guys build out and the services you provide. Um, you make our communities, you help make our communities a better place for everybody to live in. And I think on behalf of everybody at Ibar, I want to thank you for that. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Great. Well, with that, I will conclude our meeting. I want to uh, thank everybody for participating and listening in and asking great questions. And um, we will have another meeting next month. You'll all receive notification of that in the coming weeks. Again, thank you. Have a great day and stay healthy. Thank you.